Welcome back! Today we're going over another game by Shusaku during his childhood. Uh, this is back in, I believe, 1842 when he was raided uh, Tudon, and he was only about 12 or 13. I'm not sure, I don't think we know his exact birth date, but he's right in that range. So obviously a savant among Go players to be so strong at such a young age. And uh, in this game, he takes uh, black. He's still, uh, you know, not quite uh, up there like he will be later in his life. And so he's playing against, I think, a five don this game. And I kind of get the sensation that his five don opponents at this point in his life were getting a little frustrated at giving him handicaps because he just kind of tends to thrash people when he gets a two stone handicap. So. The focus for this lecture is going to be counting techniques and positional judgment. And I know counting, it sounds really boring, but until you start counting, you don't really have the ability to make strategic judgments and go because you're not sure if you're ahead or behind. And I'll go over a few different ways that I've seen people count and the way that I use uh, as we go through this game. So the you may know that in... Uh, 19th century Japan, the 3-4, uh, 5-3, and 5-4 points were much more common than the star point openings, and the star points were generally only for handicap games. And you do see players begin to experiment uh, in the 1840s, 50s, 60s more and more with playing the star point, but at this point uh, it's really uncommon for somebody to open on a star point unless they have handicap stones. And you can see that Shusaku himself opens, you know, just for overall board balance, I would almost just want to play another star point so that I could develop in either direction equally and not give white an obvious approach, but there's nothing wrong with this move. Black plays really solidly down in the, uh, the lower right, and in modern Go, this is considered to be just a little slow. And, you know, when I say that, you know, something is considered a little slow, that doesn't mean that you should never play it in your games. On the level of professionals, where you're trying to get the most out of every single move, this is just a little slow. And, you know, that might only equate to, you know, a half percent differential in the odds of black winning the game over thousands of games. But that's enough for a professional to discard this move. And in a handicap game, playing this type of solid move is a valid strategy, so we can't say that there's anything wrong with it, per se. White uh, wants to develop as quickly as possible, being already behind on the board, so approaches the upper right. And this was a very common tactic in 19th century Japan, when you had a handicap stone, was to play the large knight move and try to rapidly enclose the corner to get a lot of territory. So that's what we're going to see Shusaku do here, is that White comes back to defend this stone. And, and part of the reason that White does this is that this stone over here on R13 is not really pressuring the White stone on the top of the board very much. You know, if Black comes back and pincers, White can still go into the corner. So White has the leeway to come back and defend this group, because once Black has this solid formation here, a pincer would be fairly severe, not to mention an extension from the R13 stone. So it, like I was mentioning, Black just takes a big corner right away, and uh, it's really hard to fault that strategy you know, when you're playing a handicap game, if you just take big territory from the get-go when you're playing a handicap game, it's really hard for white to, to come back. And, you know, we just kind of see white's not getting very much for these two moves compared to, you know, if we compare the two white moves on top. A two-space extension is good. It gets us a base. But compared to the amount of territory that black got for the two moves, you can definitely see that black is getting more for this. But, you know, that's to be expected when black has the handicap stone already in place. So, there's not much to be done there. Black takes Sente to approach, which is obviously, more or less obviously, the biggest point on the board. You know, we could also look at, you know, playing something on the lower side to make a big framework. But, generally, I think that approaching, you know, uh, asymmetric cornerstone is, and even today, approaching a 4-4 stone is pretty much considered to be the biggest move after the empty corners. So... This is a pretty pretty standard technique. And like I said, white is developing really fast because they are behind 
a little bit. So, and again, we see the same tactic of black is going to make the large knight's enclosure. And this is totally playable, even today. If you want to experiment with something in your games, try this. You know, because if white comes in, you're still going to get a lot of thickness. And if they don't, then you can play uh, the d3 move to take a big corner very easily. So, that's something you might want to experiment with in your games. Here we see a very unusual extension. Normally we would extend to k4, but again, white feels behind because of the handicap and is going to go for as much as possible. The other thing is if you're, if you're white in a handicap game, you want to play moves like this that kind of invite your opponent to invade so that you can fight and get into something tricky where your theoretically greater strength will come in more handy. It makes it, if black decides to invade this right away, then there's going to be a fight, and it's probably in white's favor, because if they are the stronger player, it's more likely that black will make a mistake. So this is a pretty common handicap technique. You build something really big, force your opponent to invade, and then they have to fight on unfavorable terms to stay in the game. Shusaku makes a big extension of his own, which also pincers the cornerstone a little bit. This is kind of, you know, kind of loose. White's got lots of room to come out and do different things. White kicks and then comes out. Black extends. White puts the pressure on. And now we can see with this stone here, the invasion point here and here, the, there's, a, there's a lot of things that white can do now. Uh, the invasion point here kind of threatens to link up on either side. Uh, white could even just press from the top and keep black really small and build up some center influence. So black goes ahead and plays something that looks kind of slow, but uh, this is kind of, you know, Hante. This is a proper defensive move to keep black's position secure. Now white comes over here to sort of, you know, in some ways this is an asking move, seeing what black will do. And what white would really like is for black to just say, oh no, there's a, a white stone in my sphere of influence, I better link up all my stones. And uh, this is valid in some situations, but this is also very low, it's not making much territory, and this exchange is very favorable for white. So white could just leave this as is, and consider it a forcing exchange. Because if we take the white stone off the board, if it's black's move, black is never going to look at this side and say, oh, I should play here. That would be great. No, no, black would play any number of other moves, but dropping down to the second line for no reason would not be one of them. So you can kind of see that if there's no white stone here, this would be a bad move. So even with a white stone here, it's still kind of a bad move. You know, if you needed to link up your stones, you could consider it. But in this case, white's not strong enough to force black to do that. So black does, uh, black resists his op opponent's intentions and jumps out up here, which is kind of threatening the stone on a larger scale. Black says, no, I don't want to, you know, like, I don't want to drop to the second line. I want to come out with my stone up here, make sure I'm strong in the center, and then look to attack this stone at some point. So white leans on the top, you know, because now white is also looking to attack the two black stones at C12 and E12. So leaning on a, and this group on top is very strong when black makes this move. And this is the type of group that you want to attach to and lean on because it's already really strong. So if, you know, it's already super strong and we make it a little stronger, it doesn't really matter. But this stone is going to give us more power to the outside towards the active area of the board and help us with the attack on these two stones. So black again somewhat resists and with black being so strong to just extend like this would be really passive. This is this is not an acceptable line for black. So black's going to hane out. And again, white's just building more strength out towards the center of the board, looking to attack the stones on the side. So now black does basically a similar thing. Black says, you know what, I want to attack this stone over here at d9, so I'm going to lean on the stone over here at f3. And in this case, this is not as clear of a excellent move as this attachment up here, because this stone is not that strong, and maybe we want to take the corner, or maybe we want to invade over here, but black has a plan, and that plan is to attack the white stone at d9, so this is how black is going to move forward with that. And we have a pretty typical sequence here, you know, black takes the corner, gets a little bit of influence to the outside, and, and now with these three white stones, this extension kind of makes more sense than when it was just a four-point jump from the F3 stone. You can see that this 
extension here. It's still a little loose, there's invasion points, but uh, white's lower position is definitely coming together. And now white jumps out with the stone. And this is really light, you know, because white's saying, you know, I don't want to get tied down to this one stone. So if white just jumps out like this and black peeps, well now this is really heavy. You know, we've just got three stones with no base floating in the center of the board. Black's going to attack. This is no good for white. So white plays much more lightly. And it's important when you're in your opponent's sphere of influence, if we look, you know, black has all of these stones, all five of these stones facing this white stone. So it's kind of five on one right now. You don't want to tie yourself down to a stone that's under such heavy attack. So this two space jump is really nice because now if black comes back and plays something like right in here, there's a good chance that white's just gonna say, you know what, like, I don't even care about that one stone. If you wanna capture it, go for it. I'm just gonna build up a lot of thickness towards the center. And this is a little passive on white's part, but I'm just demonstrating that the two space jump makes it much easier to sacrifice the white stone at D9 than a one space jump or a diagonal move, which would really tie you to that one stone. So again, black jumps out, which is, you know, just basic, you know, we, we're attacking these stones, so we got to keep them separated from the stones on top, because if we try something else now, you know, it's like if we, you know, if we do, um, you know, jump out on this side, well, now it's kind of like, well, white could play something like this, and now it's like, well, we're kind of tying all our stones together, and connection and separation is a big deal in Go, and so this is just kind of a natural move. It's like, well, if you don't know where to play, one thing to look at is like, well, let's just keep the weak stones separated from the strong stones. That's pretty basic. So it makes it easy to find moves if you think, you know, in just in terms of the fundamentals. So white pokes a couple times to get a little bit of shape here and then caps these stones. So this is, you know, again, pretty basic strategy. White strengthens the weak stones and then caps to attack. Nothing too complex going on here. Black comes out. White continues to make shape over here, so now it's like, okay, well, these stones are still weak, but, you know, we've got a little bit of shape, you know, it's, we've still got a way to escape to the outside. This is going all right for white so far. Black jumps out here because black doesn't want to get sealed in with this group on the top. That would not be good. The, you generally, if you can keep a connection to the center with your groups, you generally want to do that. And white turns... And now these two white stones are getting pretty weak, so white pokes at the corner to give it a little bit more of a base, and then jumps out himself. Because if white ignores this and says, oh, okay, now I want to go back, I really want to make sure I've got room for eyes here. Well now, you know, black comes out like this, and this white group is totally sealed off from the center of the board, and that gives black a lot of influence. Not to mention the fact that these stones, which, you know, might have been weak now that white is undercutting and threatening to jump into the eye shape, they're just connected to this strong corner now. So black says, no problems. The nothing to worry about. And I, I, th I think I get that no problems from watching Longstride's videos, which if you haven't seen his videos, they're really great. I, I'll put a link in the video description, but that's something that he says a lot. It's like, oh, no problems, no problems. The, uh, I, I really like his game commentary. So black pokes at the shape. And instead of just defending back here, white jumps out. Because white's saying, you know, it's not so important that I get a base here. It's important that I keep impacting the game by jumping out and threatening to do things in the future. Because if white again says, oh no, oh no, I need, I just, I'll live. And then black comes through and cuts this stone off. Well, yeah, white can still kind of struggle out here. But, you know, losing this stone and making black thick in the center is not going to be real helpful when this fight is kind of the main focus right now. It's, it's not whether or not this top group can make a base, it's whether or not this black group will come under severe attack or escape easily. So white's focused, has his eyes on the prize, which is the big, and I mean this is not really a good shape, you don't really want five stones in a row in a diagonal move, it's really heavy, and your opponent is definitely going to try and attack that if at all possible. So, you know, and then the, thing, the nice thing is, is that once white makes this move, black defends, and then white gets to come back and defend. And now this push and cut is not working the same. So, just, it's kind of neat. White's really trying hard. Black comes out and then jumps out to attack this stone. Because white has to jump here to keep black from connecting easily. 
white reinforces the lower group because now, you know, if white decides, okay, we need to uh, keep attacking here, now a black invasion somewhere down here uh, or possibly here could really create multiple weak groups for white. So white can't let that happen. White has to do something, you know, one weak group is manageable. If you all of a sudden, you know, like we can see that if black does come in here, then white is potentially looking at the A group being weak, the B group being weak, and the C stone being weak, and that would be really tragic, really sad for white. So white has to defend. And then black comes up <clears throat> and then plays in. This is a really, uh, really vicious sequence, actually, for black. Black plays inside, threatening to do a lot of things. And then this, I believe, to be an overplay because I think white is looking at some Aji of maybe being able to capture the A stones, but black has moves prepared for this. I think black had already read this out because white plays another move on the inside to threaten to capture these, and I think the idea is, is that, yeah, black could play at A, but then white can descend at B and separates and basically breaks the side apart in Sente. Uh, black has to come back and capture, and then white can jump out, and white's pretty happy with this. Unfortunately, black has this move, which is very interesting. This is, you know, kind of threatening this connection over here. And then when white plays this, because notice that this is becoming important now, you know, um, if white can capture these three stones at A, then it's okay if black cuts at B, because the C and D stones will be connected because of the capture at A. But after this diagonal move, which I kind of, it seems like maybe white overlooked this diagonal move in this position, because uh, white has to come back to firmly capture these three stones in here. And remember, three stones is only one eye, so this is not going to be a living group yet. And then black has this neat, somewhat ugly move right here, which threatens to push through and capture the B stones. So white, again, has to play here to firmly capture the three stones, but then black connects on the edge. The connection between A and B cannot be cut, and the, the two stones over here at C and D are definitely captured now. So it seems like white's plan was to break into the left side, and now black expanded the corner, connected to the B stones, which were, and remember, the B stones were the stones that white was trying to attack. So this is a very big turn of events. And in order to really understand just how big, we need to do a little bit of counting. Now, there's no real definite territory down in the lower right. I'm going to go ahead and take these off because I'll be using the letters. So there's no real territory down here yet. I mean, black could play to take the corner, white could slide in, black could come over. But since we don't know yet, we're not going to count anything over in this corner. However, this corner is pretty easy, and basically, you know, when you have a nice rectangular shape like this, you can kind of be like, oh, okay, this would be 3 by 5, that's kind of 15, but let's just say 14, because probably a uh, white will be able to push at A at some point. So we'll just say 14 points for this corner. And then the way that I personally count is in pairs of 2. So, you know, it's like basically on the A line, I'll go, you know, one, two, three, three pairs, that's six points. And the reason I count in pairs of twos is that it makes counting captured pieces very easy. So for example, while I would count pairs for A1 and A2, uh, B1 and B2, C1 and C2, etc., and then the same thing here. So here we've got six pairs going up through to this point, seven pairs with this, eight pairs with this, and then the captured sounds are just nine, ten. And Typically, the way that we imagine that things will go, if we can't tell, for example, it's not really clear if a black move at D2 is sente, and it's not really clear that a white move at D2 is sente. So typically, we just imagine that the stones just go straight down. And this just gives us an easy way to visualize what the potential territory will be, because we just we don't know if, if black will get time to come down. And, you know, maybe white will ignore this descent, and then black will have the monkey jump, which would really reduce this white territory on the side. But just for, you know, estimation purposes, it's best to just 
And when you're imagining these stones come down, always make sure to add equal amounts. So there's two black stones, and here's two white stones. It's just a really basic, you know, that way you're not giving a subtle advantage to one side or the other. So anyway, we had 14 points up in the side, and then we have six pairs, seven, eight, nine, ten, um, plus the one. And then we can imagine that, you know, probably white will get to push down here a little bit. So we can go to another pair, another pair, and then again, at the edges, I just tend to estimate directly towards the edge of the board. So with this, you know, open space here, I might imagine black having something like this. And then maybe something like, you know, this at some point. So this just gives us a way to estimate uh, how much territory black has going on over here. So this is 12, 20, 2, 4, about 27, 14, and then maybe 5 up here. So 27, 14 is 41, plus 5 is about 46. Go ahead and take these stones off so we remember where we're at. So we have about 46 points for black. And for white, we have, again, maybe five in here. It's really hard to estimate these types of territories because there's this big double centé point here. So, you know, you can kind of say it's a small group on the edge. It's probably about five points. And then what about nine plus uh, 11, maybe 12 in the corner? Five, 12, we've got one, two, three, maybe four pairs, eight here. Uh, that's 25. And then maybe say about, this is really hard to estimate too because it's so open in so many ways, but let's just say 2 and 9 is 11. So we have around um, 5, 8, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, about, you know, about 30 for white. And we counted, you know, 40 plus, like 45-ish for black. So right now, since white doesn't have any big framework in the center, and since the black group over at A has connected to the group at B, so black has no weak groups, it seems like it's going to be really hard for white to overcome the difference. And remember, there, there's usually no Komi in a handicap game, but there was no Komi period uh, at this time. So the, if black is ahead by 15 points on the board, this maneuver on the left, where black connected up and made edge and corner territory, has definitively given black a huge advantage. And if you were to just glance at this board, it may not be clear to you that black at this point has a huge advantage, unless you did a little bit of counting. Now, another technique, um, and this is the one that I've seen uh, Haley L, who has another excellent uh, Go series on YouTube, what she'll do is she'll count the captured stones first. So she'll go one, two captured stones in this area and, and then say, okay, that's four points. And then she'll count the rest of the points individually, which seems to work really well for her. So there's different ways to, to do this. And you should you know, practice with different ways. And when you get good, you'll be able to count uh, one player's score in under a minute easily with a little bit of practice. And that will give you an idea of how you should play strategically. Because if you're ahead, like black is in this game, and white has no big prospects, like if white had a big center moyo that we had to invade, that would be different. The game would be much more even. But we can see black's coming to the center here, black's coming to the center here, black's coming to the center here. There's not really, there's no player that has a really definitive edge and influence at this point, particularly, like I said, now that the A group is no longer weak because it's connected to the corner. So if you're looking at this board and you're white and you're a pro, you realize that you're really far behind, that you need to cause complications, that you need to attack, that you need to kill something or get really big compensation. And if you look at this board, there's only one place that it looks like white might be able to attack, and that's the A group. Because the B and C stones allow you to come underneath somewhere around D and rob this group of a base, and if we kind of look on the outside, it looks like, okay, yeah, we've got stones, you know, that are going to help us. We've got this guy over here, you know, granted these two black stones are kind of in our way, but we, we have a possibility to attack. And 
when you can count, at this point, it's kind of a narrow path. White has to create complications. There's not room to just play normal moves and hope that the game reverses itself, especially against an opponent like Shisaku. So what we'll see is that, first of all, we get some player, some you know, basic moves. Uh, notice how solidly white plays here. White's preparing for an attack and wants no weaknesses left behind. And so basically, white gives black a much bigger corner area than is strictly necessary. But white's plan is to attack the group up at one and hopefully kill it, and that will reverse the game for white. So black takes a huge corner here. You know, this is really thick. You know, black or white can capture the one stone, but that'll just solidify black's corner. Uh, white plays another forcing move to give this group a little bit better uh, eye shape. And now white goes on the attack. And for the rest of this game, what we see is an example of attack and defense because white desperately needs to capture the A group to win the game. It's the only way that white has a chance at this point. And so black continues to come out. White gets some forcing moves here and there. This is really clever, too. Uh, a lot of times players will see that this stone is an Atari and immediately go to connect. But we can see here that the damage is not so big. When black instead comes out like this, if white captures here, we just come back. And these cuts don't go anywhere. So there's nothing to worry about. You know, always, when your opponent Atari's a stone, don't immediately save it. Ask yourself, is that stone really vital? Because oftentimes it's not, and you'll have a opportunity to play something more important. So here again, we're seeing, you know, White's playing this sort of disemboweling maneuver, taking the base away from Black, forcing Black to run away. And this is White's plan, you know. It's, and White has this plan because they counted, they saw they were behind, and they identified the one sort of weak group on the board and went to attack it, because that's their only chance to come back in this game. But black knows this as well, and you can see here, you know, white eventually does capture the stone because it's sente, but black says, I'm not concerned about that. And now white desperately tries to keep this group from connecting, to keep it, because it doesn't have two eyes. You, we can kind of see that there's white can poke and poke, and, you know, there's just, there's not two eyes up here. So black has to get out, but there's just not quite a way. So this is kind of a clever sequence, because otherwise black will descend and just capture these stones on the side. So white has to defend, and now black's connected, and the game is over now. Like, this was white's chance is gone. There's no way for white to cause much more in the way of complications. And so when black connects here, white resigns. So this is a little bit shorter game, a little bit shorter video, but, you know, I just wanted to convey how important it is to do some rough counting here and there to understand what the relative position is. Because if you're winning by 15 points, then you don't need to do crazy things like do or die invasions. You don't need to go all out on attack. But in this case, when white was behind by 15 points on the board, then white has to come up with a plan to attack black in some way. And so we see from this move right here at 85, you know, white has decided what to do. We need to attack the black group on top. And the whole rest of the game is just about whether or not that attack works or fails. So, you know, this, this type of understanding only comes when you know whether you're winning or losing. And so in a lot of ways, your ability to think strategically about Go is entirely dependent on your ability to at least do a rough count of the score. And you don't have to be exact. Like, you might be off by five points in one direction or another, but if you count that one player is ahead by 15, even if you're off by five points, you know that if you're the one ahead, that you can play solid moves, you know, just play your sente endgame, reinforce your weak groups, keep everything calm. But if you're behind, you need to do something, you know, and, and essentially, since this attack doesn't work, this is an overplay for white. Trying to attack this group is an overplay. White would get more points at the end of the game not by starting here to remove the eye shape, but instead playing in the center 
to make more points of territory. But White's counted and knows that just getting a few more points in the center will not win the game. And so White has to do something more extreme than that. So that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed that. And, you know, like I said, there's different ways of counting. I tend to count in pairs. I've seen people, they just count the captured stones as, and then double them and then count individual points. Uh, some people count in groups of five. Other people just make rectangles and say, okay, four by three is 12. Da, 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 you know, so you can try different things, see what works for you, but at least try to start getting a rough count of the territory. And that'll also help you in your ability to evaluate Joseki. It's like, okay, well, if we go back closer to the beginning of the game, before we get into all this fighting, you know, we can kind of see, you know, who got the better deal. Did white get the better deal in the upper left, or did black get the better deal in the upper right? And we can see that black's territory is a good three, four points bigger than white's solid territory. And so when you're comparing two results, that gives you an easy way to evaluate, you know, and then also you've got to think about who got sente, who started with a stone there. There's lots of things to consider. And the other thing that's important about counting is that it gives you a way to understand endgame moves more clearly. Like, what is the value of this move versus, uh, actually, versus, say, black does something else, and white plays this second line diagonal move to reduce black's territory. And once you know the value of those moves, your endgame becomes much, much stronger. And the one of my favorite lines about the endgame is that, you know, it's not necessarily people's favorite move, but it is definitive because it comes last. So even if you're a little bit ahead or a little bit behind, a better endgame, if you're coming down and you're going to take the game all the way to counting, that's the last part of the game, and so you need to have at least a little bit of understanding of the value of moves, and then also whether those moves are sente or gote is always important as well. So that's it for now, and thank you for watching.